Hello and welcome to the Commander's Quarters, your Magic the Gathering source that helps you command your budget. This show and episodes like this one are possible thanks to viewers like you. If you're looking for an easy way to help support this show, make sure that you like, share, and subscribe. Also, hit that bell notification icon so you don't miss any new episodes. You can also go check out our playmats and other merchandise at thecommandersquarters.com. Another easy way to support this show is with our TCG Player affiliate links. So whether you're buying a deck or individual cards, you can use this general link right here or one in the description. And the final way that you can support this show is by supporting us directly by becoming a patron. There are many benefits to being a patron, and I truly couldn't do this without all their support. There's even a brand new Brigadier General tier where you can get a shout out on a Commander's Quarters episode that's dedicated to you. Hello and welcome to everyone's favorite, the infamous Golden Toilet Awards. The newest set, Innistrad Crimson Vow and the Precons that came along with it have a lot of really exciting and inspiring commanders that players are really well wanting to build around. And then there's the ones that are in this episode. Unfortunately for every single commander in this episode, this is not the type of award that you want to be nominated for or win. These commanders might be bland or uninspiring, or maybe I just really don't like them for one reason or another. Regardless, the winner of this award will of course be receiving the Golden Toilet. And the commander that does win this award will keep this trophy and the shame that comes along with it forever. Now, commanders can be considered for this award for a multitude of reasons, some of which I have already mentioned. But again, at the end of the day, every single commander selected for this award is 100% based off of my own opinion. So the commanders that you might select for this award might be very different, and that's okay. And in fact, your very favorite commander from this set might show up on this list, and it very well might win the Golden Toilet Award, and you know what? If that happens, I'm sorry in advance. Also, just to clarify, this is not a list of the weakest commanders from the set in the pre-cons. This is just a list of the commanders that I don't like for one reason or another. These are the commanders that are my least favorite from the set, or in other words, the commanders I think are the worst from the set. There is a completely separate episode that will be coming out in the near future that goes over the tier rankings for the commanders. Now, before we jump into the awards ceremony, a big thank you to Eddie for all the great discussions around these cards and all the other cards, you know, that we discussed from this set and the pre-cons and everything. But of course, if I make any mistakes on this episode or if you don't like the picks on this episode, always remember to blame Eddie because it's always Eddie's fault and never my fault. And of course, now with all that said, let's jump into it. Now, there are a maximum of 10 commanders that you would see on these Golden Toilet Awards, but actually, from this set in the pre-cons, there are only 7 that made the list, so, yay! There weren't 10 commanders worthy of the Golden Toilet Award, and that's probably a good sign for a set. Regardless, coming in at 7th place, we've got Rhoda Geist Avenger slash Tim and Youthful Geist. Rhoda is a 3-3 human soldier for 3 and a white that partners, obviously, with Timon, because if not, you wouldn't see both of them on the screen. Anyways, it has Vigilance. Whenever a creature in controls becomes tapped, if it isn't being declared as an attacker, put a plus one counter on Rhoda. And then Timon is a 3-4 spirit that costs four and a blue, and it has partner with Rhoda, obviously. It's a flyer, and it has the beginning of each combat tap up to one target creature. So I think this partner commander combination was actually really close to being a really interesting one. There's just one thing that's holding it back. I like the idea of a payoff from tapping your opponent's creatures when they're not being declared as attackers. But the payoff on this one is just, okay, your commander gets bigger. Uh, I find that very uninspiring. Cool, I can Voltron it and win. Great. If that was a different kind of trigger where, you know, whenever an opponent's creature becomes tapped if it's not being declared as attacker, maybe you scry one every single time that happens. Or maybe, you know, you get a token, which uh, maybe, okay, maybe that's a bit too powerful. Maybe it's a zero one one token. Maybe you get, you know, a blood token. Maybe you get something. Instead of just, okay, yeah, I tap my opponent's creatures, my, you know, one of my commanders becomes huge, and I attack. Meh. Give me a more interesting payoff than that, please. But if you do want to build around this commander, I will recommend some cards very quickly. Bluster Skull, Sleep, and Ensnare can all tap down creatures, well, a ton of creatures, all at once very quickly, so yeah. There's a lot of triggers for that. And of course, you can get other benefits from actually tapping creatures. You know, other than just, you know, getting those boring counters on your commander, you can actually draw a ton of cards with Verity Circle. And of course, you can draw a ton of cards based on the number of tapped creatures with cards like Borrowing 100,000 Arrows, which is a weird name, and Theft of Dreams. Regardless, yeah, Rhoda slash Timon is definitely a partner commander combination that made this list because, well, it was just almost there. It was almost there. And then, you know, to me, it, it just fell 
pretty flat in its face with just being, oh, okay, I tap my opponent's creatures, this one gets huge, and I swing. Boring. Or at least I should say again, boring to me, but hey, this is my list. So yeah, Rota slash Timin, I guess congratulations on finishing 7th in the Golden Toilet Awards. But now let's move on to number 6 with one of the Precon Commanders, the face of one of the Precon decks with Strefan, or Strefan, I'm still not sure how to exactly pronounce that, Mortar Progenitor. This is also another one of those commanders that I felt like was just almost there, it was very close, just didn't quite make it. It's a 3-2 Vampire Noble with flying that costs 2 black red. It has at the beginning of your end step create a blood token for each player who lost life this turn, and I was very interested when I first started reading that. But then when this commander attacks, you may sacrifice two blood tokens if you do put a vampire card from your hand onto the battlefield, tapped and attacking, gains indestructible until end of turn. I honestly just don't feel like these two parts really marry up all that well. I mean, okay, yes, they do, in a way. But I, I think that I was just kind of disappointed that the payoff wasn't kind of, you know, bigger for, you know, making all these blood tokens. It's like this deck kind of wants you to go in two separate directions. It wants you to basically have vampire tribal, but also kind of, you know, group slug at the same time. Obviously, there are certain cards that do overlap, but I think it's just kind of clunky, and this commander could have been a lot more impactful. You know, even if, say, this was instead, hey, okay, you need to sacrifice three blood tokens, but instead of this being limited to just a vampire card from your hand, it can be, you know, any creature in your hand. So that way you can kind of dedicate, you know, to group slug effects while also just having massive creatures that you can, you know, get into play and can really take over the game. There are a few vampires in Magic that have a really high converted mana cost that you can cheat to play with this that can be impactful, but there really aren't all that many. Many of the best vampires are more low to the ground. And if you really want to run a vampire tribal deck, you're probably going to go in a different direction, like, you know, <clears throat> Edgar Markov. So I really just don't know what the home for this commander is. I mean, I felt like it was going in a very interesting direction at first, and then again, this the, the payoff just isn't quite there. Now, obviously, again, there are low-to-the-ground vampires that can help you out that you don't need to cheat and apply, like, you know, Vicious Conquistador, Pulse Tracker, which, you know, when they attack, each opponent loses one life, so it's got that kind of group slug where you're making all your opponents lose life to make those blood tokens and guarantee those blood tokens. And you can also even get more of those blood tokens with Falconrath Gorger, which says each vampire creature card you own that isn't on the battlefield has madness. The madness costs equal to its mana cost. Basically, you know, activate the blood token, discard a vampire, and you can actually cast it if you want to. And with Group Slug, you can also benefit from a vampire like Florian, which basically, you know, helps you mini tutor off the top of your library based on the amount of life lost. And again, there are, again, those high-end vampires like a Kazarov saying your pure blood, which, you know, can get bigger and bigger based on creatures getting dealt damage, but still, there really aren't too many of those high-end vampires. And again, if you were to cheat, say, any creature into play, maybe cheat in, like, Marionette Master, which, again, basically can, you know, help you utilize those blood tokens in a very synergistic way to, you know, start draining your opponents for a ton based on your blood tokens going away. But alas, Strefan, or, or Strefan, whatever your name is, more per gender, I am very sorry, but although you are the head of a pre-con, you are also up for the Golden Toilet Award. You did not win it, but you did finish sixth. Moving on, though, let's move away from number six and on to number five. In fifth place, and this probably will surprise no one because this keeps happening, and very rarely it doesn't happen, but hey, a mono white commander has made the Golden Toilet Awards. So step on up, Katilda Dunhart Martyr slash Katilda's Rising Dawn, you have made number five. Now, I've discussed this many times in the past, but Mono White is by far the most underpowered color in Commander, and it's not even close. So because of that, when it comes to a Commander that is in Mono White, it really has to do something special to actually kind of get over all of those disadvantages that it has for being in Mono White. Now, unfortunately, Katilda does not do that, and that's not the reason that it's in the Golden Toilet Awards. It's because it's just kind of more of the same from a, you know, Mono White Commander, and actually, I think that this one should have been Selesnia at the very least to actually make it playable and to make it interesting and I think they just missed the mark with that. I mean Katilda was actually you know Selesnia to start off just because Katilda turns into a spirit doesn't mean that it you know has to lose the green. I mean there's definitely green spirits out there. Come on. Anyways Katilda is a star star spirit warlock with flying lifelink and protection from vampires which is very relevant if you're playing against you know your friend's Edgar Markov deck all the time but other times it's not really all that relevant. Power and toughness equal to the number of permanents you control that are spirits and or enchantments. And there's a disturb cost of three white white because you've got the back, which is basically just, hey, it's an aura that does the exact same thing as the front, but it's on another one of your creatures. And if we've been to a graveyard from anywhere, it's exile. So this is just basically a, a Voltron commander that cares about enchantments and spirits. 
And, and that's basically it. Again, it doesn't provide you any kind of other value. You don't get any extra card advantage, which again, you desperately need if you're in mono white. So again, I just find this commander to be pretty boring. And again, not what mono white needs. I mean, I'll go through some cards really quickly though, if you'd like to build around this. Brave the Sands, always watching Duel's Heritage. Ways to essentially, you know, pump your commander. You know, you want to utilize a lot of enchantments to pump your commander just naturally and also give additional effects. And of course, to make this commander absolutely massive, maybe utilize all that glitters, which gives it plus minus one for each artifact and or enchantment you control. You can also utilize, you know, enchantments that actually get rid of things like cast down or enchantments that make other things like Sigil the Empty Throne that can make you an angel army. Regardless, overall, again, just another disappointment for me when it comes to a mono white commander that is just basically, again, more of the same. It doesn't really inspire kind of all that interesting or different kind of a deck. This is just basically, okay, Voltron, but with enchantments instead of just, hey, regular Voltron. Or, you know, again, your typical mono white commander that gains you a bunch of life. Or, you know, makes tokens. Something different plays wizards. So, again, because of all this, Katilda, you have finished at number five. But now let's move away from Katilda at number five and on to number four. We've got a card that actually has a name that is uh, pretty fitting for being in the Golden Toilet Awards. Anya, Maid of Dishonor. The first Anya was so interesting and unique, and this one is just, well, disappointing in so many ways. She's a 4-5 vampire that costs 2 black red. She has, whenever she and or one or more other vampires enter the battlefield under your control, create a blood token. This ability triggers only once each turn. We'll get back to that part here in a bit. Also, pay two, sacrifice another creature or a blood token. Each one loses two life and you gain two life. I very much dislike over limiting a card, and I think that this card just is, well, very over limited. With the way that this card is worded, you're pretty much limited to, and there are ways around this, and I might talk about those, some of those here in a bit. Basically, one blood token each trip around the table. Because this card is limited in multiple ways. First off, it says one or more. So basically, it doesn't matter if you get one or 40 vampires in play, you're still only getting one blood token for that. And then also, this ability triggers only once each turn. So again, doesn't matter if you get, you know, 40 vampires in play. Like, I don't know why I keep saying 40. That's a lot. But regardless, it doesn't matter if you get 40 vampires in play throughout your entire turn. You know, across main phases, doesn't matter. You're still only getting one blood token. The limitation on this card is limited twice for whatever reason again i don't think that blood tokens are overpowered and yes you can sacrifice them to drain your opponents but you have to pay for that anyways so like strephon or strephon or whatever the name is again this is kind of like a hey you could build vampire tribal in this direction although it's not very effective but i don't think many players are going to go do that because if they really want to play vampire tribal they're just going to play edgar markov because it's more powerful and it's not very limited i mean i'm not saying that limiting cards is good but this one isn't interesting enough or doesn't give you enough to actually be, you know, inspiring to build around it. I think that the text, this ability triggers only once each turn, those seven words are probably my least favorite thing to see on a card because, you know, I am a Johnny and I like building around effects. And as soon as you put that limiting factor on, it's like, oh, okay, you don't want me to break this thing open, but you're also just making it so this card is extremely hampered. So yeah, those words are probably my least favorite to see on a card, you know, outside of also activate only as a sorcery. I just, come on, please. Instead of limiting cards in those ways with just those words, design them in better ways. There are ways to balance things without just completely ruining a card. Okay, off my soapbox about words on magic cards. Anyways, if you want to build around this commander for whatever reason, here you go. How about vampires that give you other tokens that you can sacrifice with, you know, Carrier Thrall, Callous Blood Mage, or Gluttonous Guest. And then other ways to make and utilize blood tokens like Arterial Alchemy, Markov Enforcer, and Sign of Opulence. But yeah, overall, I think that Anya, there was something there, again, with, you know, creatures coming into play and giving you blood tokens, but the extremely limiting factors of this card just makes it so that I'm not interested in it at all. So yeah, Anya, you are definitely the Maid of Dishonor, finishing at number four. And speaking of a fall from favor, let's move on to number three. And this is actually a commander that I've mentioned multiple times in this episode so far, or at least the, the character is, sorry, is, is a commander the different card regardless number three we've got edgar charmed groom slash edgar markov's coffin because this coffin's also a card anyways yeah this is probably the biggest fall from grace for a character again like i mentioned many times edgar markov is an extremely powerful and popular vampire tribal commander and i there aren't going to be very many players i think that try to build around this edgar because well why do that Edgar Charm Groom is a 4-4 vampire noble that is an anthem for your other vampires, and it says when it dies, return to the battlefield, transformed under its own control. 
it turns into a coffin. Yeah, the more and more that I see this card, the just further it falls. Anyways, the coffin says, at the beginning of your upkeep, create a 1-1 one, one white and black vampire creature stone with life flake and put a bloodline counter on Edgar Markov's coffin. Then if there are three or more bloodline counters on it, remove those counters and transform it. So yeah, you can basically just kind of have this, you know, undying commander where you just, you know, if it dies, flips into a coffin. Then eventually you get it to flip back by making vampires getting bloodline counters on it. The problem is, again, other than just being an anthem, it's really not doing all that many interesting things. Uh, again, I hate to keep bringing up old Edgar, Edgar Markov, but... That one can make you a lot more tokens, and just, you know, for basically nothing, it's an eminence effect. So, yeah, again, other than just making you tokens and pumping them, there's not really much going on with this commander, and very, pretty much no reason to actually move from the other Edgar to this one. So, why does this one exist? I mean, if you want to more slowly make vampires and lose out on a color, you know, with red being gone now, go for it. But, other than that, I just find this to be a very uninspired design. Now, I do like the piece of design where, you know, this actually flips and you get the backside of the card on death. I think that's pretty cool, but give me a bigger payoff for, you know, it actually, you know, being the coffin. Or maybe give me, you know, a payoff for when it flips back into Edgar. Give me a big payoff for that. Give me something other than just a couple of tokens over a couple of turns and, and a mediocre anthem. Yeah, if you want to build around it, Viserysir and Dulgeriscrat are some, you know, sacrifice outlet vampires, so they can help you sacrifice Edgar if you want to. Etching to the Chosen is also a sacrifice out that can also be an anthem for your vampires as well, so consider that. Also, other ways to make vampire tokens like Call the Bloodline can come in handy. Legion Lieutenant can also, you know, just be an anthem for your vampires, a more effective one, you know, being lower to the ground. In Butcher of Malak here, of course, you're going to be sacrificing creatures, get rid of your opponent's creatures by making them sacrifice creatures as well. Regardless, yeah, I think just the, the disappointment is mostly from, you know, a couple of factors. Again, the buildup of, hey, Edgar is coming back in this set, it's going to be really exciting and then just kind of completely falling flat on its face and not doing anything kind of different or interesting. And it gives players basically no reason if they want to build a vampire tribal deck to not move away from Edgar Markov. So because of all that Edgar Charm Groom slash Edgar Markov's coffin, you might just want to stay in that coffin, Edgar, because you are at number three in the Golden Toilet Awards. But now let's move away from Edgar and his coffin and on to number two. And coming in at second place, we've got Dorothea, Ventral Victim, and Dorothea's Retribution. Or Slash, I should say. It's the backside of the card. Dorothea is a 4-4 Flying Spirit for just white blue. Those are some pretty cool stats. Anyways, when it attacks or blocks, you sacrifice it into combat. Oh no. But don't worry about that. Luckily, we can disturb it back into play. So by disturbing it, I don't, I don't even know if that's the right term for it. Anyways, it's an aura that enchants creature, and then whenever this creature attacks, that you get a 4-4 white spear creature with flying, the tap that attacking, sacrifice the token event of combat. Pretty much kind of like that Geist of Saint Traft aura card. Basically the exact same thing. So yeah, I hope you like recasting your commander a lot, because this commander just, you know, has to be sacrificed when you attack or block with it. And if you really care about building around that aura, well, that's like a total of five mana the first time, because you cast the commander for two, you just serve for three. That's five mana for an aura because you're a 4-4 on attack. That's it. And again, auras can just be pretty weak in magic because they're essentially a two for one when the creature is actually dealt with. So then, you know, you get it back in your command zone, then you pay four for your commander and then three again. So it's seven mana for the aura next time. Yeah, yeah, just, just not good, not an inspiring design in my opinion. I mean, there are ways to get around actually sacrificing, you know, your commander, you know, if cloud shift or essence flux, you can do things like that to actually blank it. So cool, you get to keep your 4-4 around, great. Or Grace for Reprieve can actually bring it back into play when it dies if you do sacrifice it. So, yeah, if you really want to build it completely around that just for a 4-4 flyer, sure, go for it. And if you really want to build around that aura, well, maybe you have some things that can actually protect themselves like a Invisible Stalker that has Hexproof and it can't be blocked, sure. And maybe you want more ways to get more Angels, so Rootborn Defenses, cast them like that to populate and give your creatures indestructible until end of turn, so get an extra Angel that'll actually stick around. And you can also, of course, use Song of the World Soul or other populate effects to do the same. Regardless, yeah, again, a commander that actually actively tries to take itself out and then in return makes you pay mana to get, you know, a okay aura from your graveyard just seems like a lot of workarounds for not a big payoff. So again, Dorothea, congratulations. Because of all this, you have finished at number two. And now the moment that you have all been waiting for, we have finally made it to the Golden Toilet winner at the number one spot. And the winner of the Golden Toilet of Innistrad Crimson Vow, again, if you can actually call them a winner, is Audric Blood Cursed. What in the world were they thinking? And I'm not saying that because Audric is a vampire, okay? Magic storyline aside, and now we've got a blade in magic. That's great, right? 
I'm saying that because this card is absolute garbage. It's a 3-3 vampire soldier for one red white. When it enters the battlefield, you create X blood tokens where X is the number of abilities from among flying, first strike, double strike, death touch, haste, hexproof, indestructible, lifelink, menace, reach, trample, and vigilance found among creatures you control. Count each ability only once. Why, wizards, why? Again, I have complained about limiting factors on cards that did not need to be limited, and this is definitely a prime example of that. So realistically, if you want to build around this commander, you need to just build miscellaneous creatures with basically all of these abilities on them to hopefully just get a couple of blood tokens, you know, because you don't have just overlapping abilities left and right. Also keep in mind that Andrik himself doesn't even have any of these abilities, so you're getting nothing. If, uh, if, if your board is empty and Andre comes into play, you get nothing. You literally just have a 3-3 that does nothing. It gains you nothing to play. Who in the world play tested this and was like, yeah, this works great. Yeah, 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 okay. I gotta get all these miscellaneous creatures in play that have miscellaneous things. I only get one blood token for every single ability because it would be unfair for me to count them thing twice. And you know, Andre definitely doesn't need any of these abilities either. It's working great. <clears throat> what? Just, just what? Th this card could easily be fixed. I mean, give Audric first of all, okay, first strike or something. Give Audric at least one thing, maybe two, okay? Maybe two just to guarantee two blood tokens. And then allow abilities to be counted more than once. So if you really want to just build, you know, a flying tribal deck around Audric, you could. Or double strike tribal or whatever other, whatever abilities, okay? Instead of just limiting them again to the point where they are just obsolete, Please make cards that actually work. I mean, in all honesty, at a, at a base value, you're getting more from Blood Servitor from this exact same set. It's a 2-2 construct for three. Same mana cost, or converted mana cost, I should say. When it enters the battlefield, you get a blood token. This, at the very least, guarantees you one blood token. Audric cannot do that. This is just one of the biggest misses and again, it's just like, it's like they didn't play test it at all. It's like they, they I, I can't imagine you can tell me that they're like, yeah, we played a lot of games of Commander with us and it worked fine. I got my little hasty goblin. I've got my little soldier that's got first strike. I've got, you know, my little bird that's got flying. And then I get Audric and play, I get three blood tokens and that's a huge payoff. Wow. I mean, did they really just expect players to build around this with like miscellaneous keyword tribal and just hope that things work out? And, and again, the payoff is just, oh, you get blood tokens. Great. N no no payoff for having a certain number of blood tokens in play, or, you know, when you sacrifice them, you get an effect. Nope, nothing. Just, hey, play random miscellaneous creatures, and then get Audric in play, and then get blood tokens, and yay, it all works out. So, yeah, for that and many other reasons, Audric, you are most definitely, by far, the golden toilet of Innistrad Crimson Vow and the Precons. So, Andrik, make sure you check your mailbox for the Golden Toilet Award, which is most definitely on its way. Again, a huge thank you to all the commanders that competed for this, well, not so prestigious award. And if you haven't seen my most recent episode on the Golden Pig of Innistrad, Crimson Vow, and the Precons, make sure you check that episode out, because it's basically the exact opposite of this one. Instead of it being the worst commanders in my opinion, it's the best commanders in my opinion, my favorite commanders from the set in the Precons. And instead of getting a toilet in the mail, they get a pig in the mail. Oh, okay, well, not, not like a live pig, like a, a, you know, a little statue, you know, like the toilet statue, okay? Anyways, I hope that you enjoyed the Golden Toilet Awards, and of course, as always, thanks again, and have a good one.